All right, let the church say amen. Uh, before we get started, you know, we wanted to open uh, this lesson today with a prayer for Ukraine. Now, some of you may remember we had a family visiting with us some years ago, the Skoloba family, who are actually members and leaders of the church in Ukraine. And so this is real personal, right? We've even gotten updates from them of exactly what's going on on the ground there. Uh, so we're going to pray for them. I would encourage you to continue to pray for them. Um, right now, the, the women are in Poland. The men are still in Ukraine. I'm trying to make it very real for you because I know we hear and we see, but it, it's, it's a real thing that's happening. And so God, we want God to be at work even in this um, war that's going on in Ukraine. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Not just now, but we hope we can continue to pray for them and lift them up. Please bow with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you now, Lord, because we've heard of many things happening in the world, but this one seems to be just a little bit closer to us. Father, members that we have sat with, that we ate with, that we fellowship with, Lord, are now in the midst of a conflict uh, in Ukraine. Father, we pray that you will be with them, uh, that you will strengthen them, Lord, even now as they have separated one from another so that the women could be safe in Poland and that the men can continue to work things out in Ukraine. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them with strength, with wisdom, with encouragement, Lord, um, as this is such a trying time for them and everyone around them. We pray that, that they are still keeping their eyes fixed on you and that they are able to minister to those around them. Because we know that this tough time can also be a time for those to come to know you as you want to be known. We pray for the wisdom of the leaders of Ukraine, the leaders of the West, the leaders of Russia, the leaders of China, all those who play a part in this. We pray, Lord, that your hand would descend on them, that there would be humility on all sides, and you will help this uh, war come to, to an end, that there might be peace which would give an opportunity for true peace, which can only come through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for just, just making this real for us and giving us that opportunity years ago to connect with the Skolobas. We pray, Lord, that you will just keep their feet fixed and their eyes fixed on Jesus as they go through this. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to lift them up. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. So today our text is coming from Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. Um, my question for all of us here in person, those of us who are online as well, are you an influencer, right? I'm using that new 2022 language, right? Are you an influencer? I know the young people in the room, they get that right away. Um, another way I could say this is, do you have influence? Are you using your influence? The reality is that everyone who has breath in their lungs, um, has blood in their veins, you are influencing someone, whether you know it or not. Uh, the bigger question that we need to really ask ourselves is, are we an influencer for God, right? That's the question. What is an influencer? An influencer is someone who has the power to affect the decisions of others. Once again, we all in one way, shape, or form or another have this ability to influence, whether we know it or not. Oftentimes, we like to play down and figure, hey, who's listening to me? Who's watching me? Who's paying attention to me? You'd be surprised how many people are actually watching you and paying attention to you. And so the question is, is are you allowing this opportunity that God gives every human being, whether you're a Christian or not, he gives every human being the opportunity to influence, to be an influencer. And guess what? I know this is going to be um, crushing to some of the young people here. You don't need Instagram. You don't need TikTok. You don't need um, Snapchat to be an influencer. You can actually do it in person, face to face. Many times I think we miss those opportunities, but we can use those uh, online platforms as well to be an influencer. Today, what we're talking about is salt and light living. Right? That's what God calls us to. That's what Jesus calls us to as we read here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. I will ask you to turn with me, to swipe with me, whatever you're doing today to be in the word. 
please read along with me as we look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Very familiar passages of scripture. You know, we sing songs about it, right? Um, and so we're going to dig a little deep today as we look into these verses. The Bible reads in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and, and following, it says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen? And so we've heard this before. Like I said, we sing songs about it. It doesn't matter who you are. You've heard this little light of mine, right? I'm going to let it shine. We've all heard those songs. Let's dig a little deep and see what this is actually saying to us, what Jesus is communicating to us. How am I supposed to influence the people around me? The first thing Jesus says here is that you are the salt of the earth, right? Now let's think about salt for a second. We're going to think about it in three different ways. The first way is as a seasoning, right? Um, everybody loves salt. I don't care who you are. You love salt. Even if you get those fries without salt, it's so that you can control how much salt you actually put on. I remember years ago, and, and I know probably somebody in this auditorium uh, is connected to this, but I remember years ago, a sister, this is back in Stony Brook, a sister made biscuits, and she mistakenly made those biscuits with unsalted butter. And we were like, oh, that's probably not a big deal. What's a big deal? Unsalted butter. When you bit into that biscuit, it was like eating paper. It's like, what is this? Why? Because something as simple as salt was missing. I encourage the parents in the room, when you get an opportunity with your own children, buy them a bag of unsalted potato chips. And let's see, let's see how quickly they eat those up, right? Nobody likes to eat unsalted potato chips. No one really wants to eat unsalted fries because salt brings flavor. It's a seasoning. Now, what does that mean for us as a Christian? Well, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 to 6, that we need to season our speech with salt, right? When we talk to people, and I, and I like what the, the scripture reader said today, is that we have an impact. We have an opportunity to impact, right? When we talk to people, what we say needs to be seasoned with salt, right? We need to season it with salt. We need to make sure that what we're saying is, is keeping in align with the good things of God. If we find ourselves just doing what everybody else does and saying what everybody else says, there's no salt there. It's like bland. There's no standout, right? We really need the opportunity to do that. The Bible says here, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. How do we walk in this wisdom? It says, let, let your speech always be seasoned with grace. Uh, always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Jesus is telling us as being the salt of the world, salt of the earth, we have an obligation to make sure that what comes out of our mouth is seasoned with the salt that comes from the word of God. Are your conversations with non-Christians seasoned with the salt of the gospel? I know some of us, we spend a lot of time talking to people. And it, you look, the Knicks, they're doing pretty good this year. We could talk about that all, all day and night. But the reality is, is talking about the Knicks, talking about the weather, talking about what's latest in the news, Bitcoin, whatever, it's not going to bring anyone closer to God. We need to make sure that that speech that we're using, that we're, the words we're using, is actually drawing people closer. Same way salt, you know, you can't just eat one, right? You got to eat more and more. Well, people, as they hear you talk, hopefully they want to hear more and they want to hear more. That's what should be happening. Let's talk about salt as a preservative. Now, this is something that may be less common to us because, you know, we have refrigerators. And so when we want to preserve things, we put it in the refrigerator. Meat, we put it in the refrigerator. Fish, we put it in the refrigerator or the freezer. But years ago, and I know my own, my own dad talks about when they would 
um, I'm trying to make it PC, right? But when they would prepare their meats, right? Um, they would salt them down and put them away for a, a later day. That's how they preserved that meat. And so as being the salt of the earth, we are also called to be a preservative, right? Think about that. What are we preserving? We're preserving the moral health of the world. Imagine if you lived in a world where there were no Christians. There was no God. What would that look like? We already know what it looks like when God is present and we're involved. But what would it look like if we weren't here at all? Right? We have a responsibility to be a preservative as the salt of the earth. Listen to what the Bible says here in 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16. He says to give yourself entirely to these things. Let your progress be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the things you teach. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save, right? What, what is that save? That save is, that's preservation right there. You will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now imagine if you're a Christian and you're, you're working in an environment, you're living in an environment, and you never mention Christ. How can you be a preservative? How can you help people find salvation? How can you save yourself and how can you save others if you don't talk about it? If your speech is not seasoned with that soul? It's very important that we realize that we are a key ingredient, if I should say so, to the lives of the people around us. And if we are not being that seasoning salt, we're, we're basically allowing people to just go straight to hell. We need to make sure that we're speaking the words of life that will save both ourselves and others. Also here in Mark chapter 16, 15, speaking about that preservation, that salvation, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature, right? Everyone. Now I'm going to tell you a little trick. You know, when I was, when I was in my, some of my um, jobs in my workplaces, you may say, Rob, you, you've gone too far, right? But one of the things I used to do, especially in, in a large organization, I would list everybody's name that's in that organization with me. And I would slowly say, have I spoken to this person? Have I spoken to that person? Have I spoken to that person? Because I believe that God had put me in that place for a reason. It wasn't just there to collect a paycheck, but I was actually on a mission to be an influencer to the people in that place. And I know it may seem very um, like a fanatic or, or, you know, <laughs> I'm out of my mind, which I am for Christ. But I wanted to make sure everyone knew before I leave this place, I need to make sure that everybody knows about Jesus. And so it says, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. How in the world is someone going to get to the point where they believe and be saved if my speech is not seasoned with that soul? If we're rubbing shoulders with each other every single day on the job, we've been living in the same neighborhood for years and years, and I've just never talked to my neighbors. I never talked to the person in the cubicle next to me, in front of me, around me. You know, just I've just never done it. How in the world are they going to have an opportunity to obey this gospel, to believe and to be saved? It's up to us to make sure that our speech is seasoned with that salt, so that we can speak words that are preservative, that help people draw nearer to God. The last thing that salt does, um, salt is, it was, a value, it was a valuable to people at the time. In fact, the little picture there shows the soldiers, Roman soldiers used to get paid in it, right? Um, instead of getting physical money, they would get salt, right? Um, hence the, the saying, he's worth his, what, what is it? He's worth his uh, measure of salt, something like that. And so I want you to understand that another thing that God is saying when he says that we are the salt of the earth, not only are we a seasoning, not only are we a preservative, but we are also valuable to God, right? We have value. In a world that has us constantly comparing ourselves to someone else, right? Constantly comparing our situation to the person we see on Facebook or Instagram, God says, you don't need to compare yourself to anyone at all because you are valuable in my sight. The Bible says here in Matthew 10, verses 29 through 32, 
It says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. I st I'm still fascinated by that. That God would know every hair on my head. Not, not only would he know it, but he says they're numbered. There's like a number one, a number two, a number three. And God knows that number. Who, who else knows that number, right? I mean, it's not like you can say, oh, my wife knows me so well. She knows the num my, she's numbered my hairs on my head. But God says he knows and he's numbered every single hair on your head. It says, do not fear, therefore. You are more of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. I hope, I hope you see how these things are all lining up, right? How seasoned soul helps me to be a preservative. And as I do that good work of God, it also helps me to feel valuable in God's eyes because I'm not ashamed of him. And he says, therefore, he's not ashamed of me. But if I stay quiet, and you guys know what I'm talking about because we all go through it myself. When I stay quiet, that's when thoughts come in my head. I start questioning things. I wonder, am I even in the kingdom of God? Is the spirit of God living in me? Am I worth anything at all? Maybe God does it, is not with me anymore. Those are the thoughts that start whispering, getting, getting whispered in our heads. Why? Because it's so quiet. God needs us to speak up, right? And as we start to share with others, I've always found this to be true. I'm really sharing with myself too. As I talk about God and I talk about Jesus, guess what? I'm reminding myself also. I'm reminding myself when I share with others um, about the love of God, as we see here in John 3, 16, very familiar passages of scripture, for God so loved the world. Um, but I want you to put your name there, right? Think, think for a moment, put your name there. For God so loved Rob that he gave his only begotten son that if Rob believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. I do believe God wants us to be very personal with that. I know it's for the whole world, but you know what? It, it, it sounds and feels really good when I think about it for me, right? That's how valuable I am to God that he allowed his one and only son to die for me. Put your name there, right? Put your name there. For God so loved McDonald, right? That he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved Kyler, that he gave his only begotten son, right? And you keep going through and you're like, wow, God loves me that much that he would allow his son to die. And we know that it's not just on the cross, but there was a lot that led up to that. And that was for me so that I could have salvation. So that I could be the salt of the earth. So that I could speak words of salvation. And so that ultimately I can see that my value is not about what I wear. It's not about uh, where I live. It's about Jesus in my life. That's powerful. Right? That's very powerful. And so... We need to remember that we are called to be influencers and we do that the way salt influences the world around it also. Let's talk about the salt effect, right? What does the salt effect look like? Well, that's people changing the way they speak around you. And some of us have experienced that, right? Somebody may, may utter a curse word and say, oh, I'm sorry, Laddie, I'm sorry. Pastor Laddie, right? I'm sorry. And, and we laugh about that because we know we get those names. We get those titles. We don't ask for them. Right? You know, but we get those names and those titles. And sometimes if we're not aware of the salt effect, we may say, oh, no, 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 you don't need to say that because of me. And we're right. They don't need to say it because of us. But what they're actually saying is, man, I see God in you. And I'm sorry. Right? I see God in you. And I'm sorry. They may be joking about something or they may even say to you, you know what, as you're approaching Wait, stop. You don't want to hear this, right? You don't want to be, you don't want to hear this, what we're saying over here. To me, that's the salt effect. People changing the way they behave, right? People thinking twice about doing something because you're in the room, right? You're in the room. They're like, oh, we should. Oh, no, never mind, never mind, never mind. Right? Why? 
because salt is, is in the room. And they know with that salt in the room, we need to think twice. And you know what? It is really, believe, believe me, it is really God in you. It has nothing to do with you, right? Because if it was up to us, we'd probably be down with whatever they're doing. But because God is in us, people are like, well, let me think twice about what I'm about to say, what I'm about to do. That's a salt effect. Are you an influencer, right? Are you influencing the world around you uh, like the salt of the earth? Are you someone who's affecting the decisions of others, like the salt of the earth? Something we need to think about and we need to ask ourselves. Let's look at light. And light we're a little bit more familiar with than uh, salt in many different ways. But Jesus asks the question, or he tells us, I'm sorry, he doesn't ask the question, he tells us. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world of the world. And so one of the things that light does is it dispels darkness. And one powerful connection here, as we look at John 8, 12, Jesus himself says that I am the light of the world. Now, now stick with me for a second. Jesus, the son of God, who is God, who came from heaven to earth, the most powerful human being who's ever lived, died and resurrected, says that he is the light of the world. And then what does he say to you? He says, Mark Brazier, you are the light of the world. He says, Isaiah Booker, you are the light of the world. Now think about it, what I'm saying here. God, Jesus, says, I am the light of the world. And then what does he do to us? He elevates us to you are the light of the world. To me, that's like, like my mind is blown. That, that Jesus says, now that I live in you, the same power that I had to impact this world that I'm walking in those three years uh, or 33 years and three years of his ministry, he says, I'm giving you that same power to impact the world around you. He says, you are the light of the world. He didn't ask you, right? He didn't say, Brittany, do you want to be the light of the world? He didn't say that. He said, Brittany, you are the light of the world. Teresa, you are the light of the world. Now, Asia, you are the light of the world. What does that mean? That means as light, I dispel the darkness around me. I don't call it near me, right? You can't be in a dark place and turn on the light and there still be darkness. No, when you are in a dark place and you turn on the light, there's light. In fact, some of us, right? Some of us, not all of us, know that in some places where it's really dark, they're these little creatures that crawl, crawl around. They love the darkness. Call them roaches, right? <laughs> Some of us know about that. Not everybody knows about that, right? But guess what? When you turn the light on, see, I don't even know, but some people know, right? <laughs> they scatter, right? Now, if that's an image of dispelling darkness, then what should happen when the light of the world, the same light that Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and he says, you are the light of the world, what should happen when I come into the room? When that light is shown on people, when they see the light of God in you, what should happen? Well, if they're like the roaches and they don't want to be a part of that light, they should run away. And you know what? The reality is, is we need to be okay with that. This is, this is the challenge. It's sometimes we're just not okay with that. We're like, oh man, I don't have any friends because they keep leaving me. Every time I talk about God or I say church or Bible class, they're like, oh, I can't hang with you anymore. And we're like, I feel bad. But what's the reality? The reality is if I am the light, what I'm going to attract is more light and the darkness is going to run away. And, and that's a, sometimes a hard pill to swallow, but it is, it is reality, you know? Growing up, I had five very close friends. Close friends, when, you know, <laughs> close. That means we did everything together, right? We got in trouble together. We, we just, I'll leave it at that, right? We, got, we did everything together. But out of those five friends, three of them, when the light was shining, said, I don't want to have anything to do with it, right? Quite honestly, one of them said, hey, ganja is my God. That's what he said. 
And I was like, okay. Two of them, right? I had two friends at that point. One of them said, hey, I got to see what you're doing because something's wrong. You're, you're changing too much. He's seeing the light. He's like, you're changing. You don't listen to the same thing. You don't watch it. You don't go to What's happening, right? So I said, look, come to Bible class. And that, that young man, who's not so young anymore, but that young man <laughs> came to Bible class. And when he was in Bible class, one Bible class, he saw not only my light, he saw the light of like maybe 10 or, or 15 other people. And upon seeing that light, guess what he said? He said, what do I need to be a part of this? I said, you need to be baptized. He's like, baptize me now. Now, of course, I said, you need to study first. <laughs> but he was like, baptize me now. The second friend, who was a little bit more difficult, but fortunately, he had knee surgery, so he couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> and so we said, you know, we're going to bring the light to you, right? And so for six weeks, it was like light therapy. We just, we opened the Bible, and we just, we shone on him, right? Let him know the music. No, we got to change that. We got to change this. We got to change that. And of course, you wonder, is this even working? Is this therapy working? But you know what? At the end of probably the eight weeks of the summer, he's like, you know what? I need to be baptized. Right? Now, I could have said, you know what? Let's not, let's not shine too much light on him. Let's, let's ease into this, right? We don't want to scare him away. But guess what happens when we don't shine the light? The darkness starts to cover it. Right? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Hebrews chapter eleven seven says, by faith, Noah, and this is what we're afraid of, but Noah did it. He says, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. This is what I, I think is missing right now amongst us. Godly fear. The reason why I stopped listening to, you know, worldly music wasn't because someone said you need to stop listening to worldly music. It was because of godly fear. I knew that what I was listening to was not promoting God in my life. Of course, I had a little help by the tape, the acapella tape getting stuck in my tape deck. But the reality is the fear of God is what changed it, right? I remember another scene, and you, you're going to have to hold me accountable, whoever's keeping time, because I think I might be going over today. But um, I remember another account. There's this thing called... Greek Fest, right? At Jones Beach. I don't even know if it still exists, right? And it's like a worldly, 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 worldly event. And I remember me and two other people on our way to that event. And godly fear took over. And I turned around, right? Now going to the event, everybody's like, yeah, we're going. We turned around and it was silent. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. Guess what? In doing that, moving with that godly fear, okay, both people in the car didn't become Christians, but one of them was like, okay, I, I see where this is going, right? What I need to do. It says that Noah moved with godly fear. And he did something that nobody thought was possible, right? He's telling them, look, it's going to rain. Can you imagine saying it's going to rain to people who've never seen rain before? Never. They've never seen a drop of precipitation come from the sky. And yet that's what Noah was telling everybody is going to happen. But he moved with godly fear. I can guarantee you, you're going to bring more people to Christ, being like Christ, than being like those people. It's a guarantee. It's scary, and you may not be uh, fully convinced, but I tell you, the more you move to God, the closer you're going to bring others with you. You're going to be an influencer the way Noah was an influencer, not necessarily to his generation, but to generations that came afterwards. I mean, imagine we're still talking about his story thousands and thousands of years later. Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are in, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, right? So if we didn't know what, what walking in the light is, well, the Bible just told us, right? Goodness, righteousness, and truth. And when we talk about truth, one of the things about light is that it exposes, which we're going to read here in this passage. 
Truth is not just telling the truth. Truth is living in truth. Truth is being transparent. Truth is not being secretive, right? Sometimes it's easy to have a secret life and then have our life that we, we have amongst one another. We need to make sure that those lives are one life. It's one life that we live in truth, that we don't have a life on Instagram and then a life uh, in real life. I think that's actually a thing now, right? IRL, I think, in real life. I, I read that this morning as we move into the metaverse and all of these things. We don't want to have a virtual life and then a real life. They all need to be the same. They all need to be the same. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship. This is the hard part, right? This is the hard part. It says have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Have no fellowship. Our brother did the Lord's Supper and he talked about how sharing meals is a form of communion. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's a bringing together. Ask yourselves, when you sit down to eat with somebody, what is that experience like? Is that an experience where you're really taking an opportunity to shine for Jesus? Or is that an opportunity for that person to try to cover over your life? We need to make sure that we are shining for Jesus. And like the Bible says here, expose them. Right? There is nothing wrong with and of course, you need to do this in a right way, going back to the salt, right? I need to make sure that my speech is seasoned with salt, but I need to make sure that if I'm sitting down to have a conversation with somebody and they're talking about things that are not right or sinful, I need to tell them about it. Right? I need to be able to tell them about it. I remember a couple of guys I was going to school with, this is when I, I was going to get my master's. And one of them, he wasn't married. And every time we would go to class in, the, in Manhattan, he would always say, hey, look at that. And look at this. And look at this. You get what I'm saying, right? And I told him, I said, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't hang with you anymore. He's like, why? What? I'm like, because you're going to get me in trouble. And unfortunately, you're not willing to come on my side. So I can't come on your side. So you know what? From now on, I'll find my own way to school. I'm good. Right? Now, was that easy? This is somebody I worked with also. It wasn't easy, but now there were three of us. Now, I'll tell you that the other person, after I shared that, came to me and said, you know what? I want to be just like you. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. You just told him what you needed to tell him, and that was good. I need to tell him that too, but I don't know how to tell him. And of course, for me, I'm like, whoa, I'm like, I just trying to keep myself out of trouble, right? Trying to stay happily married and out of trouble. But what happened there is I had to shine my light. And I keep opening my jacket like some light's going to come out of here. <laughs> but <laughs> you guys get the point, right? Like we need to shine our light. We need to let the light shine. And in doing so, look, I'm telling you, you're going to change people's lives. Just recently, even in the last year or so, I remember um, being at work and, and someone decided, hey, you know, this company, they sent us, or no, we wanted to get more product. Why don't we tell them that we didn't get all the product that they sent us and then have them send us more? And I walked out and the light was like busting out. I'm like, I gotta go back. I said, listen, we have the money. We have everything we need. There is no need to lie. Now, of course, you know, sweat's coming down. You know, it's not like, I do this with ease. No, it's not easy. But I'm like, there's no way I can walk away without shining some light on this situation. And of course, they were like, okay, yeah, you're right. Let's. In fact, they were like, oh man, we shouldn't have told them. That's what they really said. <laughs> but once they told me, now we're moving in the right direction because I needed to expose them. That's what light does. It dispels darkness. It helps people to see. It exposes things. <clears throat> Another way we can talk about light exposing is by sharing the gospel, right? Um, the Bible says here, how then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I could believe that people are going to know about Jesus by just watching my life. 
But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that I need to open my mouth. I guess maybe instead of opening my jacket, I need to open my mouth, right? Because that's how the light is going to shine. I need to open my mouth. I need to talk about Jesus. I need to let people know, which I'm sure some of us do here. I do when they say, oh man, great job. Well, praise God. All glory to God, right? And, and you know, I know that is awkward, right? Like that's awkward when you might say that in a workplace, but guess what? Give it a couple of months and those people will be saying, wow, you great, thank God. And you're like, yeah, thank God, right? And you can see that that light is starting to change people, right? Move them in a different direction. That's what we want to do. But it's not going to happen if we stay quiet and to ourselves and we, we, we hide and we shrink back. It's not going to work. Um, the Bible, I mean, light, I'm sorry, not the Bible, but light. Another thing the light does is it comforts. I don't know about you, but if you're scared, having light is, is pretty comforting. Right? I can still remember being a kid and, you know, having some nightmares and staying awake. I would stay awake until about 6 a.m. until the sun came out. And then I would feel comforted. And then I would go to sleep. Right? Because there's something comforting about the light. And so another way we shine light on a situation is by comforting others. The Bible says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God comforts us. We comfort other people, right? If you see somebody in your neighborhood, you see somebody at your workplace, you see somebody in school. Yes, in school. Think about how powerful this would be in school that you see somebody and it looks like they're having a hard day. They, they might even have tears in their eyes. And imagine you come near to them and say, hey, what's going on? Maybe someone passed in their family. Maybe they're going through some hardship. And imagine in school, you find a corner and you say, can I pray with you? Can you imagine what that would be like? If you pray with that person, I guarantee for the rest of their lives, they will never forget you. Because there will be no one who will ever do what you've just done, right? I know at the workplace, it works the same way, you know? I can remember, you know, walking into one of my boss's offices, and I guess they had their paraphernalia out because they were diabetic, and so they took insulin. And I walked in, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, walked out. But once again, the light was like breaking through. I'm like, I got to go back. Now, this was a tough, this is one of my tough bosses, right? The ones that eat you up and spit you out. So I was like, ah, let, let me go back. I said, you know what? I, I, I would like to pray with you. Now I watched this lady eat up everybody in that place and spit them out one by one. I prayed with her that day. And from that day forward, I never worried about anything. I never worried about anything. I tell you, she treated me like a prince that day forward. And I'm like, what happened? Because she's just eating everybody up around here. But for me, and I can only imagine because we shined a little bit of light on it, right? It, it went beyond a boss and um, the, their underling to now someone who just sees me as a human being and who sees that I have a need. And let's pray, right? People at work, when I pray with them, wow, there's nothing else to be said. Right? They know where we are. They know who they can go to. They know who they can come and get the encouragement they need. Because my first thought wasn't, what's wrong with you? My first thought was, how can I help you? And then let's pray. Giving them the comfort that God has given me. Because he's comforted me by showing me all his mercy. Right? And his grace. And so now I'm able to share that with others. And be gracious and merciful towards them. Right? And give them the same love that God gives me. I guarantee you, if we do these things, it's very difficult for anyone to ever forget that you've loved them in a way that probably no one else has loved them that way before. I, I'll, I'll challenge those who go to school in the room, I challenge you, do it and come tell me what happened, right? I would love to hear the story.
right, of what happened when you stopped to pray with somebody at school. That would be awesome. And so what's the light effect now? I believe the light effect is when you shine your light, people thank God for you. People who don't normally talk God talk, people who don't necessarily read their Bible or, or pray, all of a sudden, with you in their lives, they begin to talk God talk. They begin to thank God, right? Something good happens at work, and they're like, wow, thank God. And you're like, who is this? And what's happening is, is that you are shining light on them to the point where they're beginning to change. And hopefully over time, they will be welcome to a Bible study. They will want to be a part of, more part of what you're experiencing in your life. But that's a part of the God effect, of the light effect, that you're going to have and help them move in that direction. And then ultimately, people wanting to know more about God, right? Uh, I know every time I talk about something that I'm doing uh, with the church, one of my bosses is always like, man, how come you didn't tell me about that? I want to I go do that too, right? Hey, we're having a marriage class. You having a marriage class? Like, is it going to be online? Because I would like to be a part of it. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, look how excited and interested this person is. And why? Because I believe it's shining the light, right? Not, not trying to hide my light, but really shining my light and helping this person see it's all about God, right? I'm not here and I don't do what I do for any other reason than God, right? Because I am the light of the world. And so <clears throat> something that we need to be warned about, right? Listen to this. There's a warning that God gives in these passages of scripture as well. Jesus speaks to us and he says that salt, right? Salt can lose its flavor, right? Hear, hear me, salt, that's you and I, can lose its flavor. And if we lose our flavor, the Bible says that we are good for nothing, basically. It says that we are good for nothing except to be trampled underfoot by men. Now, it may be hard for us to understand this concept because in Jesus' day, the type of salt they used was different than the table salt we have today. And so the salt that in Jesus' day they used came right from the sea. And if you left it out too long, the, the actual sodium chloride might actually evaporate with water in it and leave behind substance that didn't, wasn't salty anymore. And so what does God tell us here? He tells us here simple enough. If you don't use it, you lose it. If you decide I'm not going to be salty, I'm not going to be a seasoning, I'm not going to preserve, uh, I'm not going to do the things that Jesus is asking me to do, there's a very strong possibility that you are going to lose it. How will you know you've lost it? Because guess what's going to happen? Instead of you um, moving negative away, negative will be coming right to your doorstep. Right? It'll be knocking on your door. How do we lose it? By becoming engaged with the world, by losing our spiritual identity. We think that we can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to hang with these people. I know who I am in Christ. I'm not going to allow these people to corrupt my good character. What does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 15, right? 33. It says, look, bad company corrupts good character. Period. The end. You don't need to debate about it. You don't need to, to try to argue with uh, those who are trying to gu guide you in the right direction about it. The bottom line is bad company. Now, I'm not talking about, hey, I'm talking to somebody once or twice a week. No, bad company. This means I'm spending a lot of time with these people. Eventually, what's going to happen? Either I'm going to rub off on them or they're going to rub off on me. If I'm not salty, they're going to rub off on me and I'm going to lose my saltiness. Far be it for any of us to lose the saltiness, because like Jesus says here, he says, if you lose that flavor, how will you get it back again? How will you get it back again? Another warning here. We probably don't even have uh, thought about this as a warning. But he says concerning the light part of us, he says, you know, no one lights a lamp and hides it. Think about that. No one hides it, nor do they take a lamp and put it under a basket. Now, 
My intention was to actually show you this process and how it works. But once again, parent, do this with your children at home. Take a candle, light it, and then cover it in a basket. Now, anybody who knows science well enough knows that once the oxygen is cut off from that candle, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It's going to go out. And so this idea of covering this lamp with the basket is more than just hiding the light. It's gonna, the light's going to be hidden for some time, but guess what's going to happen over the long term? Over the long term, the light's going out. It's going out. So every time you decide I'm not going to talk about Jesus, every time you decide I'm not going to shine my light, guess what happens? You're allowing yourself to get dimmer and dimmer until poof, the light's out. And we've seen that happen, right? People we've known for years and years and years, uh, and all of a sudden, we're like, where are they? They're not here anymore. Guess what has been happening? What was happening? They were, they were covering their, their, their lamp. And once they covered it too long, that light was out. I encourage you to do that with your children at home. It may take a little while to get all the oxygen out, but be patient, right? Eventually, you'll see that that light goes out. Question for you is, do you want your light to be extinguished? Do you want to be someone who is no longer salty? If that happens for you, the outcome is not good, right? God's intention for us in elevating us pretty much right next to him, right? When Jesus says, I am the light of the world and you are the light of the world, it's for us to have an impact on the world around us. For us to draw as many people as possible to this light. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says to hold out the word of God like a light shining in a dark place. Are we doing that? Or are we like sneaking around like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, I do go to church. on Oh, yeah. Or are we, I don't want to say loud and proud because that sounds negative, but are we loud and proud about it? Where are you going? What are you doing this Wednesday at Bible class? What are you doing on Sunday church? Where are you going on the last Friday of the month? Oh, I have student ministry Devo. You want to come? You want to be there with me? Come on. Right? The family minister might be there. He might ask you for your cell phone, but that's okay because it's going to be great otherwise. That's how you shine your light. That's how you're the salt of the earth. And what we need to decide to do right now, everybody in this room, Everybody who's online, what we need to decide to do is we need to decide that I will be what Jesus has made me to be. I will be the light of the world. I will shine. I will shine before men that they may see the good works and glorify my God in heaven. That's the decision we need to all make. And we don't need to make that at the end of the week or next. No, we need to do that right now. When you leave this auditorium this afternoon, some of us are going to go out to eat. Some of us are going to go hang out and do different things. I encourage you, let your light shine. If you need to open your jacket like I am to make you feel like your light is shining, do it. But let your light shine, right? The challenge still remains the same, brothers and sisters, that we want the auditorium to be busting out. Because people see the light shining from this congregation and they want to be a part of it, right? They know some good things are happening and they want to be a part of it. My encouragement is please, please, please don't allow your light to be extinguished by anything in this life, but allow your light to shine the way Jesus intended you to shine. And if you're visiting with us and you want to get started on being an influencer for Christ, well, the the recipe is pretty simple. Right? We need to first believe the word of God. And so you need to take an opportunity, whoever invited you here, to, you know, study the Bible with them. You know, fortunately in 2022, we don't even have to, you know, be in the same place. We can actually do it on Zoom. Right? In fact, we've probably done Bible studies with people from all around the world through Zoom. But the most important thing is, is that we sit down and we just take a look at what the Bible has to say. The Bible itself is a light. Right? It tells us in Psalm that the, the word of God is a lamp unto our feet right? to guide us. 
And so we need to know more about it. It'll help you be a better husband. It'll help you be a better father. It'll help you be a better in every part of your life, better wife, a uh, better mother in every part of your life, a better child. Then we need to confess. We need to name it. We need to be able to say, yes, the way I'm living my life right now is not the way God intended me to live. There's some things I need to, to do differently. There's some things I need to get rid of. We need to be able to confess those things, and then we need to, to act on it. We need to actually change the way we think and the way we act, and then be immersed, right? Be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins uh, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, that which is truly the light in us to help us to live right before God. And then we need to be faithful, live faithfully, shining our light, being the salt of the earth until Jesus comes again. Isn't there somebody in the auditorium today? Is there somebody online who's been thinking about this, who've been contemplating what they're waiting for in their lives? Why am I waiting to allow the light of God to burn brightly in me so that I can be salt of the earth, so that I can be the light of the world? Well, I'm encouraging you right now, do not allow another moment to go by. Let today be your day of salvation. There is no reason to wait any longer because God is calling you right here and right now. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, shine your light. Amen? Good afternoon, church. This afternoon, as we prepare to partake the Lord's Supper, or communion with one another, I am reminded of the Passover feast the Jewish people observed every year in memory of Exodus from Egypt, how they placed lamb blood on the doorpost so the Lord will pass over them. According to Luke chapter 22, it was during this feast with his disciple that Jesus instituted the covenant that we observe today. It's not the first time in the Bible that we see a meal associated with a covenant. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 28 to 31, when Isaac and Abimelech had a covenant of peace, they made a feast. They ate and drank. Another covenant, co covenant is seen in Genesis chapter 31, verse 44, when, when Laban offers to offer a covenant with Jacob of their peaceful relationship, they had a meal. A third covenant is between God and his people and noticed in Exodus chapter 24, verse seven, when Moses took the book of the covenant and read it to the people, they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. And they, they ate and drank. And the scriptures say, said that in all these three occasions, God was present. The meal is a sign of communion. The covenant meal means to share, to share in the blessing of God's work in Christ. And the meal means that we come before him as one covenant people. When we remember Christ in the Lord's Supper, we remember the covenant God has made with his own people. It moves from a past memory to a present experience of the reality of God's grace. When we eat and drink, we renew our covenant with God. We pledge to keep the covenant as the people of Israel did in Exodus 24. We will do everything the Lord said. God has always promised to live among his people and to be their God. God is present among us in the covenant meal as we are the temple of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. The covenant meal symbolizes and mediates the fellowship between God and, and his covenant people. It testifies the reconciliation which God has enacted and the peace which exists between God and the redeemed and between the redeemed. It is a moment of joy 
communion and thanksgiving. The, the people of God celebrate their reconciliation by God's work. They rejoice in the redemptive work of God for them. Amen? Let us pray. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. So I sing because I'm happy, I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. So I sing because I'm happy, I'm happy. I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him, from care he sets me free, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. So I sing because I'm happy, I'm happy. I sing because I'm free, for his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Yes, I sing because I'm happy, I'm happy. I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Amen. This concludes our worship service here in the building and online. However, it does, not, it does not end our worship outside of the building. So let us continue to worship the Lord, continue fighting the fight, running the race. Amen? Amen. If you're visiting, just as our brother mentioned, we do have Bible studies available. The Bible is light. The Bible is truth. Jesus tells us the word is truth. And we want to love you with the truth. So we offer Bible studies to anyone that may be interested. Please email us at info at licoc.org.
This Wednesday night Bible class um, will be March the 2nd. It'll be about the Sermon on the Mount and fulfillment of the law on Zoom and Wednesday night Bible class. Brothers, there's a men's encouragement, Saturday, March 12th, 10 to 12. It'll be here in the building. Our brother Mark will be speaking and encouraging us with the word of God. If you're interested, please see our brother Steve Sr. For contribution, again, we will remind you what the word says, that we should give what we've decided to give, and we want to do so cheerfully. And you may do so online using Subsplash or using snail mail at the address shown. Streaming and social media, we are streaming Wednesday night Bible class and Sunday services at their normal times at 7.30 and 2. Please help to share the gospel, the light on social media by liking and following and subscribing. Before we have a closing prayer, I'd like to uh, ask our brother Pedro to come up. Uh, we'll be having a special prayer today as we remember the situations going on in Ukraine. Let us pray. Father, on this day, we're coming before you as your people to lay a burden before you that we have concerning our dear family members in the church, not just the ones that we've met personally, but all the ones that we know of that are right now going through a panic in their life. We not only want to lift them up, but also anyone across the world who is going through something like this, our hearts are with them. But at this present time, we specifically pray for all those in that situation in Ukraine. We know, Lord, that this is how evil shows itself in the world through these situations. And we pray that the light that we can collectively shine, as our brother was speaking today, can take this darkness away, can allow people to see your hand working in their lives. We pray for you to strengthen our family members in the Ukraine and in Russia, strengthen them, embolden them to let their lights shine so that others can see that you are the answer. Because we know that man's answer is not the right one, but that your answer always is. And that you can turn the tables on whatever evil is occurring in order to get your goals done. And we thank you for that, that your word never comes back without accomplishing its purpose. So let us speak it boldly. Let us share it with joy. Us here on this island, we don't have to wait for an emergency situation or a panic in order to share your word, but thank you for letting us do that constantly. Help us, embolden us, fill us with the joy of our salvation so that we can continue sharing this light and help our brethren now in the Ukraine and in Russia and all over the world recenter themselves on the goals that you have given us. Strengthen them, Father, and help this situation come to a resolution. The wisdom that leaders all over the world use in order to govern diligently and in order, help these leaders find that wisdom. It's you who give it to them anyway. Help them see it, help them come to their senses and help them promote peace by your power and by the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, amen. In heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing the glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Yes, we sing the glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing the Lord, glory and honor. 
power and strength to the Lord. Yes, we sing the Lord, glory and honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near, because the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing the Lord, glory and honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing the Lord, glory and honor. Power and strength to the Lord, and we sing the Lord, glory and honor. Power and strength to the Lord, yes, we sing the Lord, glory and honor. Power and strength to the Lord.